in like the pre the, 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 the pre 1994 phase when conservation was about land um, fences and fines and people were kept out and conservation was used as a buffer. Now we need to integrate conservation into our decision making processes. And as an example, um, this is our critical endangered ecosystem, extent of critical endangered ecosystem. That's what's left. Right. So I'll just go back again. That's extent of the critical endangered ecosystems. That's what's left. And if you overlay the mining priorities on top of that, you can see there's a quite a close correlation between mining priorities and our ecosystems. Another one that was mentioned earlier by Tanya was our uh, national uh, strategic investment priorities or projects. Again, our ecosystem map. And if you overlay the con conceptual areas for major economic investment, there's also correlation. So there's one response that the conservation sector can do is jump up and down and scream and say no. Or we can engage and say, how do we facilitate the process so we have a more responsible uh, and a more responsive development footprint across our country. And I think that is what we need to do. We need to be engaging. We need to say, what is it that we can do? So in terms of looking ahead, for technical people, sometimes it's, it's, uh, there's these big concepts out there and you can get lost along the way. Uh, and you want to go off and do the new technology and use the new tools and the new methods. And you can lose your way. But I think quite important is this meaning performance um, kind of graph which was presented a while back and I, I kind of amended it in this way is that on, on this axis you've got the meaning uh, and here you've got performance and with meaning it requires vision what what is it that you'd like to do and in performance is around about your outcome you know what, what would you like to achieve and what's the impact and the big challenge we find is that very often many people operate on the vision and they're dreamers or they're very active and they're very productive, but they're all over the place and it's not very strategic and it's not coming together. So what we need to do is we need to bring the vision and the performance, the meaning and the performance closer together. And the way to do that is to, sorry, is to have that question why are we doing what we're doing? And that is when, you know, when we have performance. But given what has happened over the last few years of, in Sandby, it's, it's an issue of around leadership as well. It's so having leadership that can give you that vision set those targets and to help develop the, the, you know, have help with the understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. Because it, in, in the absence of that, very often institutions don't get it together. You know, they're all over the place. They're not sure why they're doing, what they need to do, how it needs to be done. Um, and that is a, a big challenge. So within, what does it mean for the work that we do? So when we're looking at ahead within Sandby, specifically within bioinformatics, it's posing the question, do we know the value of biodiversity, the utilitarian, the intrinsic value? What does it mean? Do we know how, we, how it's improving the human condition, livelihoods? And can we convey this message to people outside of science? Those are some of the bigger questions. But also, then you've got to bring it down to bioinformatics. So what's the role of bioinformatics in all of this? Very often you find bio, the bioinformaticists saying, that's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with you. It's got everything to do with the way you analyze, present, collect data, and so forth. And, uh, sorry, and ask the question, do we have a shared vision? And do we have the capacity to, to do that? So the approach that we're taking within Sandby in this context is saying that we, we, we're working towards developing a shared vision with all our partners. But what we do know is saying that we need to support the research, planning, decision making, uh, policy advice, monitoring and reporting. That value chain we must support. And while the biodiverse informatics community can engage, it's, 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 not, it's not in the position to set the agenda for the conservation sector, but it's in the position to support that agenda. And looking at how do we ensure that the work that we're doing is relevant. So looking forward within Sandby, what we're saying is, sorry, we, um, we need to enhance our content. We've been collecting a lot of data over the past uh, 50, 50, 100 years, 300 years, one goes all the way back. But is it relevant? Is it important? Is it answering those critical questions? What are those critical questions? We need to strengthen our partnerships. We can't do without our partners. We need infrastructure, policy, and processes, and we need the capacity. 
So just to give an example of how we try or how we're working on this, because this is a reiterative process. It, it doesn't happen automatically. So what we are saying is, SAM is developing a, a national biodiversity monitoring framework. The next biodiversity assessment, 2017-2018, will have to report on these items. So this is what we've discussed and we've workshopped with our partners and we're taking it and having more discussions. And this is draft. So we're looking at what do we need to report on? And that is what specifically, from a biodiversity informatics perspective, is the content that we need to drive, that we need to collect. And that is the direction that we, we, we need to look at. Who are our partners, what information, and how do we manage it? Um, and part of what Sam is doing in terms of his, of his monitoring framework, this is an old monitoring framework as an example. So it's very difficult to distill this and understand what information you need. And therefore, you know, we decided to go back and have a look. And say, how do we present a more friendlier monitoring framework that speaks to everybody, that people can engage with and understand what you want to achieve? So here, in terms of content, this is give, driving some direction. In terms of infrastructure, we, we, we had the Biodiverse Information Architecture Workshop in the Feb, and we came up with some nice concrete ways forward. But it's about infrastructure that supports the big objectives. So it's not about infrastructure that's cool, that's nice, that's trendy. It's about what do we do that's a priority that will support those 2018, 2019 objectives of making that report work, making sure that all the data is collected, making sure that assessments can be done, citizen science is being part of it. So it's really driving that particular agenda that we have for Sandy. It's about quality standards and open access. And this is a big issue, and I think we'll be discussing this around the international issues, this kind of subol of acronyms. The reality is, I'm not sure if any other country around the world can afford to have multiple chapters of these international organizations or institutions or agreements in their countries. We can't afford to have an EOL and a BHL and everything. So part of the information architecture is saying, what are these initiatives at an international level that we're partnering to, do we need to participate with, the information that we need, but how do we condense it and collect it at a national level that will reduce operational cost and reduce the skills base required and, and the total cost. So our vision for SAMB going forward is not an EOL South Africa or a GBIF or a BHL. SANBI is EHL, EOL South Africa, SANBI is GBIF South Africa, so, so forth. And we'll be able to bring all our information and all our infrastructure together and report on a national basis. So this is going to be one of the areas, and I do think this is an area that for the biodiverse informatics community, a lot of the discussions with this initiative need to take place, because very often there's competing interests, there's uh, conflicting standards and processes that, does, that, that causes problems at the national level for implementation. It also fragments investments and financial investments at the national level because you're signing this agreement and with it come obligations. And then again, you're diffusing the potential impact that it could have. And in terms of a managed network, we will be strengthening this. We, we, we don't see our net partners going away. We see our partnership growing, our partnership becoming more strategic. And one of the things that, that we've learned um, also through the Sabbath program is that Partnerships are effect, as effective as one can mobilize resources as well. So this partners has got its, um, its obligations, but if SANBI identifies priority, part of what we need to do is make resources available. Whether there's funding, whether there's technology, whether there's some support and capacity, but like any partnership, it needs engagement. You can't have a partner there and let it go and think it will happen. You need to engage. But if I can just pause a moment on our African partnership. This has been a very interesting and I think a, a very fantastic learning for me personally and I think lots of other people. Within the GBIF community we're looking at how do we strengthen the engagement on, with all the African partners. Um, and this has been a, a long discussion going. Um, and we went, you know, and very often like with these discussions it goes round and round in circles. And, and we came up and, and we realized that it's not about the money. It's money is important, funding is important, but if you don't have that position of what you'd like to present as to why you're doing it, you can't go with a begging ball and ask for money. Then not, who's going to give you money for this work? So it's having that value proposition, that business case for, for this African network of partners. It's identifying the priorities. 
in the April workshop, we went through the process of identifying priorities, you know, and we've, we've listed them, saying these are the areas of importance, and that comes out of trying to analyze the fourth national country reports, because it's very really difficult, there's all these competing priorities. And looking at the fourth national country reports and using that as, you know, uh, the potential um, to unlock further discussions. We need to improve the science, and John is leading a science committee for, Af for the for African uh, network in identifying how do we deal with it and how do we build the capacity through that. And then we also identify that we need to implement processes and structural imperatives for collaboration. Again, collaboration won't happen on its own. How do we make sure it happens? And pay attention to that partnership. To let it grow and to let it be strategic. And then the, the fourth area is around capacity. Um, the approach that we're taking is that we need to look at work-based capacity as well. Um, but we took a step back, saying that we are not going to look at the high end when it comes to capacity building or the more advanced uh, techniques around modeling and so forth, we're going to look at the basics, data capture, quality control, standards and so forth. Because there's a lot of data out there, we're identifying the priorities and we need to get our partners to collect, collect them. So how do we make sure that they are equipped with the basic necessary skills to do that? And that is the focus of our work based. And then in terms of the University of the Western Cape, we are appointing the two postdocs now. We said the one area of work is around curricular development and research themes. So the one postdoc will be focusing on how to strengthen, uh, the, develop and strengthen the, the postgrad curricula at universities, bringing on board other universities in South Africa, but also in Africa and around the world that can partner in pushing through um, the PhDs that we're looking for ultimately. And then another one on innovative approaches to, to BI. You know, Tanya was right, in San we are so busy with the day-to-day -day grind that you don't have time to look up and do some innovative research. But where do we have that space? And given that biodiversity informatics is so new and so young, we need to find that space. And the university is ideal for that. You know, that is where it needs to happen, but it needs to happen within a framework. So what we're saying, in terms of the JRS project, we're identifying priorities for Africa in terms of um, those areas, and, and that will help frame this particular area of work so that we're not doing it, doing it all over the place, but doing it within a context. Because the, 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 the curricula and the postgraduate work at the university is not for South Africa, but it's for the African partnership. How do we ensure that we build the capacity to respond to the African reality? And this is quite a, I think, a very interesting, and we hopefully will make our postdocs uh, appointment very, very soon. But also the discussion we had was around how do we develop, if we're going to go PhD, more innovative ways of doing a PhD away from the traditional way of doing it. Because in, in, in April, when we had a workshop around this, I mean, Rona was there as well. We, we discussed that for bioinformatics, we're talking about the biology, we're talking about informatics, we're talking maths and stats. It's an, it's an inter, 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 intersection of different disciplines. It's not a single discipline we're talking about. It's something that needs to be defined. And this is part of the challenge defining the field of bioinformatics. We need to do the curricular development, research area. We looked at student profile, international collaboration, funding, and assessment of impact. So this is, it's very exciting work. I, I think it's, it's something new, it's, it's fantastic that, you know, somebody like Arona that's got absolutely no background in biodiversity, but comes with a information science and providing that opportunity to bring it together um, and look for innovation in that way. All right, so interesting conclusion. Very often, you know, when you, when you love doing the technical job, and I think many of us would love to go back and do that. I'd like, I'd like to go back to behind a computer and do some analysis, I'm sure. I don't know if the CEO would like to go back and do analysis of the hind frig of a frog. But it's a, very often people retreat to themselves and, and think it's all about in technical implementation. That's 10%. I think the 90% is around all of that. It's that hard work and the hard slog of getting the institution going, getting the partnerships, the purpose, the leadership, the vision, all of those things. This is where, where the challenge is. And certainly, uh, uh, my experience is that you won't achieve much if you don't have the partnerships in place. Um, as an example, having data standards just in the, in the Cape Floristic region um, took two years from development to convincing partners to sign up and use it. It was uh, patience and persistence, you know. 
Um, so technically, you could sit down, look at the standards, write it up, but it's all around getting, getting that buy-in. And then just also, um, I'll be circulating it's a, like a four-pager about, you know, the, the, between the Tanya's uh, presentation and mine, just a write-up, uh, a note on, on the SAMBI perspective. Thank you.